Now it's time for another Dice Tower Review with me, Robert Geislinger. So here we're taking a look at Professor Evil and the Citadel of Time. Now this is a fully cooperative game where players will be working together to attempt to liberate treasures from Professor Evil. The game itself is played until either four treasures have been lost or four treasures have been saved. The game is set up at the beginning randomly with, a, with half of the traps in the citadel that are currently in an off position and half that are an on and then you have three treasures currently on timers which are represented by these particular colors on the clock. On a player's turn they're first going to flip over two cards from their deck which are going to give them two possible actions. In addition they're going to have three standard actions they can take. So on a turn you're going to take three standard actions and select one of your action cards. The four types of actions you can use with your three action points are either to simply move and even moving from one room to another is one action point. You can unlock a door, which you do need to do in order to move, and that will take one. You can flip a switch from the off position to an on position in the room that you are in, or you can rescue a treasure. As I said, in addition to that, you're going to select one of your cards, and that's going to give you something else, such as here with Destiny's card. Before you roll the die for the professor, choose the face of the professor. So that's going to give her something. This one here allows her to roll the color die and consult the chart on the card. Now, I will go into how you liberate treasures here in a minute, but I'm just going to take you through the rest of a single player's turn. Once you've completed your two actions, you are going to roll the professor's dice. Now these are going to do a few things. First, you're going to have this clock die, and this clock die is going to move the timer here either by one space or possibly two spaces. So if we rolled the one, we would move this by one. Next up, we're going to consult this die. Now this die is either going to move treasure back on the clock it's going to, or it's going to move the professor. There are some here with these little footsteps that will move him, and I'll explain in a second how those work, and then there are ones here with the clock. Now if we had rolled this, say this five here, and we rolled a green, then the green treasure marker would go back by one. If on the other hand we rolled these steps, then we will also check a color, and the professor is going to move on the board by that color. Now a couple things to keep in mind is as the professor moves through rooms he will relock any doors that have been unlocked along his way and he will also re reactivate any traps that have been turned off. So in this case we've got two footsteps and a green. We have a green marker here so he would come into this room and then we have a green marker here so he would come into this room. Now this treasure this trap is off so we will flip that over. The other type on here is the secret passage. That simply means that he's going to move to the room where that treasure is directly. So if we had that in the blue, he would move directly to this room. Again, the same thing here, he would turn on any trap in the room. In addition, if he moves into a room with a player, they are kicked immediately outside. After all, we're not supposed to be in here. Now, as I said earlier, one of the things players can do, and it's the primary thing you're trying to do in this game is to liberate treasure. In order to do that, you need to be in the room with the treasure and all of the traps of the symbols that are on that particular treasure need to be in the off position. So here for this, this antikythera mechanism, we need to have the cameras off and the locks off. Well, currently, if we look out there, we'll see that that camera is off, this camera is on, those locks are on, and that one is off. So we would not be able to do so. But for the sake of argument, let's say that they were all in the off position, we would get to liberate that treasure, and we would put it over in the saved treasures position. After that, we would take these, we would draw a new location card, and a new treasure, and we would place that treasure out where this is. This one here is going to go to the vault. We would then place the timer for it 40 minutes from this marker because that is the number on it 
and but we would place the other marker on the treasure itself. As this timer mechanism is moving around, it's gonna do two potential things. The first thing is anytime it hits this mark here with the flip, one player at the table of the player's choosing will get to flip over his player card, and that will give an ongoing benefit for her, and it will give her an additional ability that she can flip this back over, but then she will lose that ongoing benefit. Destiny here, when she's flipped over, whenever you roll the dice for the professor, you may always re-roll one die. And that's a nice ability, but if she wishes, she could flip this back over to, in addition, on your turn, you may flip this tile after you roll the dice to ignore the result once. So if she didn't like the result, she could flip this back over. Now, if it got back around, she could be chosen to flip again. The other thing that this can do is whenever it reaches one of these particular colors, that treasure becomes lost. The professor has managed to lock it down. So if it got to this blue, the golden idol here, would come off and it would go into our lost treasure section. And then, just like when we liberated, we would draw a new card, a new treasure, and set the blue timer. Now, one other small thing that I should have mentioned and I didn't is whenever you liberate a treasure, any of the toke, any of the traps that are on that particular one, because they had to be off, do reset immediately to their on position, thus making it harder to get the other treasures at the table. The game will continue around and around like this until either you have lost four treasures at which point everyone at the table will have lost, or until you have saved four treasures before that happens, in which case everyone has won the game. So that's a look at Professor Evil and the Citadel of Time. Now this is a co-op game and as such it does have the usual co-op problems with alpha gamers if that's a problem in your groups. This game isn't changing anything in regards to that. And one other thing about this game that immediately drew me in is you get this Clue-like sense. Now the game is nothing like Clue, but there's just something when you look at the board you just can't help but feel like Clue. I really enjoyed the sense of urgency that happens through the game where you've got these timers going on the individual treasures and I love how you feel like you're racing against it and there's that mitigation of well if we go here then the clock's going to advance closer to this treasure but we're closer to this treasure and maybe you want to sacrifice a treasure to get yourself closer to another one. The professor does move randomly and that might bother some but in reality I didn't find that to be a problem. He's only if he moves which half the time he's not going to move hopefully he's going to move on a path that you know of one of three colors and it's really easy to kind of gauge where he might or might not go despite the randomness of it. One downside I did find in the game is in those player powers themselves. They are not very well balanced in my opinion and from game to game we tended to find that there was one maybe two players who we liked their powers better and so every time the clock got around to flipping them over we would flip them back over because we had used them previously and we found them more useful. Whereas other player powers we just tended to just completely ignore throughout each game that we played. Another pro, possibly con to the game, depending on how you look at it, is something I call the pandemic effect or the best laid plans. Now, what this means is that there are times when we would see a path to get a treasure and we thought for sure we had it, we felt good about it, but then in the end, just through bad dice rolling and the professional or moving, we ended up not getting that treasure. I even see, saw a couple of games where we had three treasures before he got his first one, and we still lost, even though we thought for sure we had that game. The artwork in the game I love, other than the board does feel a bit busy. Now I think it works for the game and it makes the, the Citadel feel full and like a real house that you're moving through, but the board can be a bit busy. One nice touch that I really like is on the room cards themselves, they put what looks like a little GPS marker that indicates where that room is in the house. And before I noticed that those were on the cards, I found myself scanning the board sometimes up to 30 seconds before I found that specific 
specific room to place a treasure in. The locks are a wonderful mechanism and I really like how half of them start on, half of them off, and you have to try to figure out and coordinate your motions through the house to turn those on and off, all the while the professor is flipping them on. And I like how as he goes through rooms, he thinks to himself, well, I don't remember leaving that off or I don't remember those doors being unlocked and he undoes everything you did. Again, that's a throwback to what I said about the best laid plans thing. Overall, this is a wonderful co-op that scales well between players. The game does say that it's for up to four players and there are five characters and technically there's no reason you couldn't play five players. I have done it on a couple occasions and the game doesn't really change too much other than I think it gets a little harder playing the five player count as it was obviously balanced for four or less, but there is no reason that you couldn't play five players in this game. The gameplay itself is wonderful, the mechanisms are easy to teach, everyone is constantly engaged throughout. Again, there could be an alpha gamer problem, this game does nothing to alleviate that, but that's up to your group. I hope you've enjoyed this look at Professor Evil and the Citadel of Time and has given you an idea whether this game might or might not be right for you and your group, and I look forward to seeing you guys next time. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer and you've been watching the Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff Inc. where you can find great games for great prices. Cool stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.